I was Menachem Abel, the father who had lost a son, who fell in Lebanon. Chief went over a booby trap. This was his only son. And I went to Menachem Abel, and the emotion was so raw. And there wasn't much talking, there was a lot of noisy silence. And finally, after 15 minutes, which felt like an eternity at least, I got up and I recited the formula, HaMakam Yenachem Otchem Betoch Shav Litzion, Kashparach Hashid, offer you comfort among the mourners of Tzion. And I was about to step out, and he called me over and he said to me, this is the Arel who lost everything, his only son. He said to me, and this is a question which is posed very often, why, pray tell, does it use this unusual expression, HaMakam, May the Almighty refer to as the place, offer you solace and comfort. And he answered his own question, after all that I've lost, my solitary consolation is Hamakom Eretz Yisrael. And that could have stayed with me, I think about it often. And the transition between Yom HaZikaron to Yom HaTzma'ut, obviously, is we commemorate the soldiers who sacrificed that we should have our independence. But factually, Yom HaZikaron was established prior to the state, Dalit Yar, because this was the date that the Gush fell. But when I think about the transition from Yom HaZikaron to Yom HaTzmaut, in my mind it conjures bittersweet chocolate. In the state of Israel was first established, people were amazed at the longevity of Yemeni Jews. There weren't accurate medical records in Yemen. Apparently these Jews were octogenarians. And there are hundreds of people who are wondering if they do they have yogurt over there. The story that one Yemen I walked into a life insurance agency in Tel Aviv and said, I want to take out a life insurance policy. The clerk said, I'm sorry, sir, but you're too old. He said, that's not fair. Why? Because you don't even know my age. Okay, how old are you? I'm 72. He said, that's much too old. He said, that's not fair. Why? Because my father came in last week, sold him a policy. <laughs> Your father, how old is he? 98 years old. Can't be? Go check your records. Clear went to the back of the shop, pulled out the file. Sure enough, a man came in, 98 years old, underwent a physical examination, which he passed. We sold your father a policy. We'll sell you a policy. Come in next Tuesday afternoon between 3 and 5 in the afternoon. We will submit you to a physical, physical examination. If you pass, we'll be happy to sell you a policy. I can't come in next Tuesday. Why not? I have to go to a wedding. A wedding? Who's getting married? My grandfather. <laughs> Your grandfather? How old is he? He's 121. 121? Why is he getting married? His parents keep insisting he's got to get married. <laughs> you know, folks, I find this microphone so annoying. Can I just try shouting? You'll see if it's better. Yeah. Is it annoying? Let me try. Let me try and shout. Is this better? Is it even popping? Worse. Okay. Okay. I gave you a fair chance. On this day, Yom Antwamut brings out the best in our people trying to embrace each other, united by a state which unites us all. Years ago, I was contacted by some woman I traveled to Israel where I live very often. And she asked me if I could bring a Sefer Torah to Israel. There are many puzzle invalid Sefer Torah, and there are men in Israel that were a former Sofrim or a dying Sofrim. There are scribes, they're retirees, they have time on their hands. And what would normally not be cost effective to repair Sefer Torah, they will repair them, and then these Sefer Torah are given to army bases, to Yeshuvim. And she asked me if I would take a Torah. And I said, my pleasure. This is an El Al flight. I'm about to board the flight. And the person steps out and he tells me, Talmud B'Tzad, stand on the side. And he then calls over to security. And you know, I'm a pretty straight guy, but you always get nervous when people start calling you to the side. And I'm waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. Yeah, 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 yeah. And the whole plane fills up. And I say, you know, can I wait? When everyone is boarded, I'm still waiting on the side, it's getting heavy. And he says, one second. Then the captain 
And the first officer come out, and they want the privilege of escorting a Sefer Torah onto the plane. So they escort me, and I, then I put the Sefer Torah, I'm about to put it on top. I said, no, 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 no. Sefer Torah doesn't fly economy. And the Sefer Torah, they put it and sat it very nicely in the business section. And one more prefatory comment. Rabbi Wine tells a story that after Israel was proclaimed a state in the old Chicago Stadium, all of, all of Chicago jury was there. The Telzers, the Kinzers, the, if you know Chicago, the, the Yeshiva, and the super not yet religious, everyone was there. Golda was a speaker. And he describes that as the flag was halfway up the rafters, everybody was doubled over in tears, just seeing the Israeli flag going up the rafters. And then as Rabbi Wine said, typically afterwards, as far as I'm concerned, they should have stopped it then and there. It was all downhill. But I can relate this story very well because that's my father's generation. My father, Racha, worked for the military intelligence of the American army after the war in Europe. And he used his position to smuggle some, a few small items, to borrow a few things from Uncle Sam, small things like jeeps, trucks, <laughs> platoon-sized tents for a nation that was fighting for its independence. He might have been helped by the woman that he was courting, that would be my mother, who's your outside tonight. She was an officer in the army, she was a whack, she was, all nurses were officers, I was just showing you off. And then my father went from working for the military intelligence abruptly to work for the joint in Morocco, smuggling Jews to go to Israel. And under the guise of being an American soldier, he came to Israel packing heavy, heavy heat. And he left Israel cold. He wasn't packing anything. Okay. Now, to our perspective, or what I call Israel's in the eyes of the beholder. Moshe Rabbeinu was not privileged like us to enter the land of Israel. He could only see it from afar, the other side of the Jordan River. And it says in the verse, lift up your eyes and look. To the west, to the north, to the south, and to the east. Look with your eyes, for you will not transgress this yard. And my question is, if he looks at the west, looking at the very breadth of the land of Israel, and he looks to the north, he's looking at the Galil, the Golan. And he looks to the south, he's looking at the Negev. But he looks to the east, he's no longer looking at the land of Israel. What was he telling him to look at? So it occurred to me, God said, Moshe, tell me, what do you see? I see trees and grass and clouds and water. Moshe, what do you see? I see sheep and cattle. Moshe, what do you see? I see people. And, you know, Moshe, look over your shoulder. Look where you came from. The memoriva, the strife, the anguish, what we went through. You can't just enter the land of Israel. You need a perspective. If you want to know where you're going to, you have to know where you're coming from. I found a similar idea to my idea. When I travel, if people want to be cruel to me, inadvertently, they put me in the room with the books. Basically, I'm illiterate, but I'm always curious what other people are reading. So it's in the Midwest of, <laughs> of America. Could you imagine the Midwest of Israel? Rehovot, <laughs> you know? So, anyway, so... There, I came across a volume called The Boy Scout Manual, which is yay thick. Fantastically interesting book. If you're ever lost, all right, the first part about folding flags and tying knots is kind of boring, but if you're ever lost in the forest second to a cellular phone, this book is indispensable. And I read there, what happens if you're traveling along the way, you're totally fabulant and lost, and you come across one of those crossroad signs, Minz, Pins, Vinsk, Schnitzelberg, and it's lying down. How can this give you direction? And the answer is, you know where you're coming from, so you can set the sign straight to tell you where you're going to. You can't just enter the land of Israel, you need a perspective. And the great question is, why? What kind of consolation is Moshe given to see the land? He wanted to enter the land. And the answer is that Moshe Rabbeinu was the trailblazer and the maverick. He generated the Slav, and he brought down the Torah, and he led us in the Midbar. And in every action, in every place where we go, he led us, and he directed us. And before we could enter the land, he has to know how to see the land. Before we can make a Kenyan on the land, he has to see the land. Likewise, regarding Avraham Avinu, it says, El Ha'aretz, 
Asher Areka, to land it, I will show you. And why show you? Why not the seemingly more appropriate Atzaveka, Ranhigecha, that I will direct you to, or I shall command you to? And the answer is, again, before, before Avram could answer the, enter the land, he had to first know how to look at the land. The Merzhagavul comments, El Haaretz Asher Areka, not to the land that I will show you, but to the land where you will be seen. Hello. God sees us better in the land of Israel. Our mitzvot have more bang for the buck, and conversely, the sins are more puissant and powerful. There was a time when Israel was not looked upon appropriately. The look was not appropriate. And that was the time of the Meraglim, of the spies. You probably know that Echa, Lamentations, is an acrostic, according to Aleph Bet. And the third chapter of Echa is a double acrostic. Aleph, Aleph, Bet, Bet, Gimel, Gimel, Dalet, Dalet. And two verses are inverted. It should be Nun Samech Ayin Pei, but there's an inversion. It goes from Nun Samech Pei Ayin. Why is that? And Chazal comment deliciously. The Chet, the sin of the Maragma of the spies was they were mocked in Pei the Ayin. They put their mouths, the pen, before their eyes. They wrote the report before they saw the land. Let me try and explain this with an anecdote. For those of you who remember, I'm 27, but those who have memories, before the Iron Curtain came down, if anyone traveled from Russia abroad, be it ballerina dancer, a weightlifter, a scientist, they always went with a KGB escort. The story goes that they found mummies in Egypt that were so old they defied the ability of the experts to identify how old the mummies were. So the Egyptians turned to the Americans, and some prestigious university put together a team of scientists. They traveled to Egypt, but they couldn't take the mummies. They were too old. They turned to the Scandinavians. And they also failed. Then the Canadians, they failed as well. In desperation. Yeah, 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 yeah. They turned to the Russians. So a Russian team of scientists came to Egypt, of course, with a KGB escort, lest they'd like it too much abroad and forget to come back to Father Russia. And after two days, the Russians were preparing to leave. And the KGB asked, how old? For those who don't know what the KGB is, it came, uh, it came after the NKVD. So they asked the Egyptians, how old are the mummies? He said, we, I mean, how do you, the scientists, how old are they? We said, we did our carbon dating. We don't know, it's, they're too old. He said, give me five minutes, I'll tell you how old he is. What do you, give me five minutes. The KGB agent went into the cave. He walked out two minutes later. He said, I know his name, his age, his eye color, his shoe size, where he grew up. He said, how do you know this? I got him to sign a confession. <laughs> that was the sin of Maragum. They wrote the report before they saw the land. They didn't have the right perspective. They didn't see the Hashkachat Hashem, the... God's providence on the land. Now, what could be more terrestrial and earthly than land? But the land of Israel is holy land. It's separate land. Instead of seeing God's providence, they saw that it was a land of Chalot Yashveha. People in the cemetery all day long, burying their dead. They didn't realize that I was doing this to protect them. The Kabbalim explained, O Chalot Yashveha, a land which devours its inhabitants. Yoshveh, inhabitant, comes from the word Yoshev, to sit. For the land that Israel cannot tolerate, cannot stomach, vegetation. It requires constant, dynamic, perpetual ascent. If you vegetate, the land cannot tolerate it. And in this regard, we're all spies in how we look at the land. In 1993, there was a comedian convention in New York. I know this because I was riding on the subway in the back of either the Daily News of New York Post, some journal of high quality, <laughs> featured the winning joke. And so I was trying, you know, in the subways, people are always reading the other people's paper. So the person got up and put the paper down, and I keep my course down, I picked up the paper. And the winner goes like this. There was a peace-loving organization which had to send a spy in a very dangerous mission to put out advertisements in international papers looking for someone who was urbane, suave, cavalier, great physical prowess. And one candidate applied, seemed to be just the right individual. But this mission was such a dangerous mission, they had to send him on a dry run. 
So he gave him an expense account at Harrods. He bought himself a trench coat, aviator sunglasses, James Bond uh, attaché case. So he goes to Heathrow Airport and boards the flight, heading to JFK. And so that no one should know he's a spy, he's reading a newspaper the whole time with his aviator sunglasses. When they land in Kennedy, he surreptitiously, clandestinely, conspiratorially works his way over to the taxi stand. And the dangerous mission was he had to go to 1567 Grand Street and find Goldberg the spy, the spy and say to him the secret coded message, the sun rises over the mountains on Wednesday morning. And you'll know this is the spy because he will reply with the secret code word, Shalom Aleichem. So this spy gets into the cab. He tells the driver, take me to 1500 block on the Lower East Side. He gets out. And again, surreptitiously, clandestinely, he works his way over to 1567 Grand Street. He sees to his dismay that in the bank of, post, of mailboxes, there's no less than 16 Goldbergs. He figures, why should I go to the 27th floor? Let me start with the first Goldberg on 1E. He knocks on the door, and finally, an elderly gentleman with a balding pate releases the deadlock and the chain. And the secret agent says, the sun rises over the mountains on Wednesday morning. And the old man said, what? He said, the sun, it rises over the mountains on Wednesday morning. He said, what? He said, but the sun, it rises over the mountains on Wednesday morning. And the old man said, oh, you want Goldberg the spy. That's an 11J. <laughs> and then there was a girl who had the right perspective on Israel. According to the story that I was told, this little girl changed all of modern Jewish history. Every city in Israel has a Nordau street. Max Nordau. What was his first name? Rehov. <laughs> little joke. Who is this Nordau with so many streets named after him? If you don't know this, you need not be embarrassed. Nordau was the second in command of Theodor Herzl, the architect of the Zionist plan. And the great name of modern Jewish history is why would Nordau, a thoroughly assimilated Jew, why would he get so involved in building the Jewish state? According to the story that I heard, there was a Hasidic couple which had but one child, a 10-year-old girl, who was struck lower than with a terrible, debilitating disease. And they went from doctor to doctor to doctor, no one could diagnose that a diagnosis, no prognosis, and it appeared that she would die. In desperation, they went to the greatest diagnostician, Professor Max Nordau. He did his research, prescribed medication which gave rise to a cure. Two years later, the girl was fully recovered. And then the family comes back, I see the couple with all the trappings, Langerekel, bulletproof stockings, had large enough to be a shine of Ohel on Shabbos. He said, her doctor, you never sent us a bill. Now, I'm not a wealthy man, but whatever you charge, it would be my pleasure to pay. Nordau responded, I didn't want any money. All I wanted this lovely girl should give me a kiss. Parents turn crimson red, but, but, but she's 12 years old. She goes to local base Yaakov. She, she can't kiss a strange man. Nordau writes, he recovered from the insult. He said, tell me, little girl, what did you learn today in school? Why, today in school we learned the story how Yaakov was traveling along the way with Derech Ephrata, and then Rachel died. Instead of burying with the other four fathers and four mothers who were buried in Rechevron, he buried her there along the way that she could offer solace and comfort. As the prophet says, Kol Brahma, a voice is heard, Rachel Mavakan Rachel is crying for children, and there's yet reward for your efforts, Vishabu Vanim Ligvulam. And the children, they will return to their borders. When he heard these words, he said, Medela, do you honestly and truly believe that to close to 2,000 years of exile? Indeed, the Jews will return to their borders. She put her hand on her heart. Of course I believe it, for it says so in my Torah. In that moment, Nordo understood that they would return and pledged the rest of his life to building the Jewish state. More contemporaneously, my saint of Rosh Hashiva, Ruchan Shmulevitz, used to tell us not to go to the Kotel more than once a month. For he feared if he go more than once a month, it could lose its numinous nature, but take it for granted. 
of all people, my Chavrusa asked the Roshiva, he said, Roshiva, Roshiva says to go only once a month, and yet and yet the Roshiva goes all the time. And Rechaim responded, I know. I can't control myself. And I believe that is the proper perspective, to know cerebrally, but once a month, but not to be able to govern the heart, and so you end up going all the time. You know, Rabbi Rosenberg never told me how long to speak. And I really want to have compassion today of celebration. I don't want to torture you more than... Can you fairly tell me, curtail, 10 minutes or go the full three hours? Can you handle 10 more minutes without overheating? Honest and true? <laughs> okay, you shall see. Okay. Uh, again, my point of my talk is the perspective which is critical how to see the land of Israel and there's a special blessing, as the Rabban explains, or a betuv Yerushalayim, to see only the good and not the bad. And some people have this blessing, they see only good, and some people find complaints and problems. And how could it be the two people could look at the same thing and see different things? So Rashi hints at this, but the Tanchuma really spells it out. When Avram took Yitzchak to the binding, it was a party of four plus. Avraham, Yitzchak, and the two lads, Eliezer and Yishmael, and of course the donkey. So it says, and it was on the third day, and Avram looked out and he saw Haramaria. He said, Yitzchak, do you see what I see? Yes, my father, I see it. He then turned to the lads, Eliezer and Yishmael, and he said, do you see it? They said, no. How could it be that two people could look at the same thing and see different things? Let me give an analogy. You walk into a physics lab, and there you have a Wilson cloud chamber, which is a smoky box of glass where electrons are shot through. I ask you, what's this? You tell me it's a smoky box of glass. I'm a physicist, I know it's a Wilson cloud chamber. We both see the same thing, yet we perceive different things. Or I'll sing for you a little tune. Na, 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 na. So what am I singing? She thinks it's a little melody, at best. And I think it's Schubert's Unfinished Symphony. We both heard the same thing, yet we perceive different things. You hear little niggin, and I hear Schubert's Unfinished. And it was on the third day, and he said, my son, do you see what I said? Yes, my father, for he perceived that those clouds on top of the mountain, that was God's holy presence. Eliezer Yishmael, do you see it? They saw scenery. You don't see it, you stay here at the donkey. He's myopic, and you're myopic, you stay here, and we shall continue. And that's always the way it is. Two people walk into a room. Two people walk into a bar. Yeah. A carpenter comes in and notices the, the woodwork. Electrician notices the electrical work. A CIA agent comes in and notices a bug. I also see a bug. A bug, I mean the listening device. This reminds me of a story. I haven't told this in so long. We, we, were, we were wed in Israel. I'm originally from Vienna. So after our wedding, we were traveling to America, and we stopped off along Vienna, in Vienna along the way. And it occurred to me that we're in Vienna, where we might as well go to, to Czechoslovakia, just 100 kilometers away. Again, because I'm 27, that's when the Iron Curtain was still up. We get into this hotel of sorts in Prague, and then I realize this is communism. This room is bugged. So I'm looking for that listening device. I don't know what I'm looking for, but I'm looking all over for it. We're newlyweds, so my wife is not yet up to my shtick. And I'm about to abandon the search, and then, aha, uh -huh, I notice this bump in the middle of the carpet, which arouses my suspicion. I lift up the rug, and I see this nut, which seems very, very suspicious. I unscrew it, and I inspect it, and it seems innocuous enough. About four minutes later, there's a very vigorous knock on the door from the woman directly below us with part of a chandelier <laughs> embedded in her head. And I don't know exactly what she was saying, but I think it was, don't look for any more bugs. Okay. We're going to skip a little bit, not that you would know. Okay, how do we develop the proper perspective towards our holy land of Israel? And that is firstly a perspective even before we enter. We may not look at going to Israel as like going to any other destination. Jerusalem is not the same thing as Acapulco, London, Paris, Woodburn. 
It's our holy land, and it's our holy city. And this requires preparation, it requires understanding. The fact is, we are in a position to develop this perspective. For holiness to be sensed anywhere, it must be sensed somewhere. Holiness was originally established in time, afterwards in man, and to be anywhere, it must be somewhere, and that some place is the land of Israel. I believe it's Naomi Shemer. I cannot reach those notes. Now, she stole these lyrics from Yudha Levi. I am a fiddle for all your songs, which means that music anywhere in the world may be musical, but in Israel, all that more melodious and harmonious. All those who lay claim to Israel, Gavre Boyal, Saladin, Richard the Lionhearted, none of the descendants ever mourned for it, nor did they fast for it. When the Moors were driven out of Spain, they left the land for good. When we were driven out of Israel and stopped dwelling there, the land never stopped dwelling within our hearts. As Rav Nachman Breslov says, Lo kol mokam shani eilech, ani holech Yerushalayim. No matter where I'm going, my destination is Israel. You can be walking the alleys of Chicago, the boulevards of Queens, but I'm headed towards Yerushalayim. We pray towards it, we fast for it, it's uppermost in our minds. Okay, if you want to see the good, there's a lot to see. And if you don't have this sensitivity of seeing the good, I'll just end with the story. There's a fellow in that epoch of Yishalayim Shalmala, 170 years ago, when humble tinsmiths and cobblers were righteous, pious individuals. And a fellow got married in the month of Nisan. I have no idea why people would do this who's going to make Sheva Brachot. But this fellow got married. And then, one week later, was the Seder. He's in his father's home. He's wearing his new kittel. He doesn't do any talking. He lets his brother-in-law do all the talking. He's known the family. And when it comes to Shulchan Orech, his mother-in-law serves the soup. He looks down in the soup and he goes, <laughs> He sees three kernels of wheat, puffed wheat, bobbing in the soup. And it's unbelievable, what an embarrassment. You know that we clean for Pesach. Shalim, they're cleaning, clean, there's nothing to clean, they're cleaning, clean. Manla tossed the soup out the window. Then why are you retell the going out of Egypt, the more praiseworthy are you? So people stayed up all night long and they gathered about the Machse and prayed Vasikin at sunrise. And the venerable Rabbi Shalayim Shmuel Salant was a very sharp man. He goes over to his son-in-law and he said, how was, the new, how was the Seder? He said, it was. So he saw something was wrong. He said, what happened? He said, eh. I teach in seminary. That's the classic answer of a student. Eh. What happened? Eh. So he goes to the son-in-law and said, how was the Seder? And he gets a lukewarm reaction. He goes back to the son-in-law. What, eh. what happened? What happened? What happened? He said, when my mother-in-law served the soup, there was puffed wheat in my soup. He said, in your soup? Yes. Everybody else's soup? No. He said, get out of here. He called the shamash. He said, bring me a shmata. He goes outside. He said, hand me your strimal. Takes the strimal. He goes around and several kernels of wheat fall out. What did he figure out? It was only in his soup. That means just one week before was the ufruf. In those days, they didn't throw pashkas and candy. They threw puffed wheat. And the moral of the story is, don't criticize someone else till you check your own strimal first. <laughs> we want to respect our Israel and have the proper perspective and never, never speak bad. Okay, thank you very much. Outside, there's a table with some of my books and CDs. I think you'll find them enriching. I know I will. <laughs>